stay hungry, stay foolish. Rita McGrath, welcome to the show. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, Aiden. It's always great to have you, Rita, and I'm always honored to have you on the show. Many times when we talk about case studies of innovation, or indeed we teach case studies in business schools all over the world, or senior executive read about successful innovation, we often miss so much of the story because we just don't know. The learning is in the failure, not in the successes. And this is really a case of survivorship bias where we focus on the successes rather than the failures. And you talked about this in one of your recent thought sparks. And I thought I'd share that with our audience because it's so, so important to take account of when it comes to learning in innovation. What we find when we go back in time and look at a case study is it very often gets reduced to little sound bites. So Kodak missed the digital revolution, Blockbuster missed, you know, video by mail. And when you actually unpack the story, it's much, much richer. So let's take the case of Blockbuster. Um, and everybody thinks, oh, Netflix was this visionary company. They, you know, really understood the internet and blah, blah, which is true. But it took them quite a while to find a workable business model. And in fact, at one point, uh, Reed Hastings actually had a meeting with the CEO of Blockbuster and offered to be bought by them out of sheer desperation because Netflix was going nowhere at that moment. And the Blockbuster people practically laughed them out of the room. Uh, Netflix wanted to be their internet arm. And the reason Blockbuster didn't want to go for it was they had an active movement towards creating a digital offering, which would combine the power of their physical footprint with the ability to also uh, participate digitally. Um, that never went anywhere itself, largely because of politics. So what happened was um, their CEO, a guy named John Antioco, uh, wanted to do two things. He wanted to get rid of late fees, which he realized infuriated customers, and he wanted to really improve their digital offerings. And each of those things was going to cost, you know, I don't know, 200 million a piece. The parent company, Viacom, wasn't interested in investing uh, in those two projects. Uh, so they took the company public at a depressed price because of these investments that were going to be made. Uh, Carl Icahn saw the opportunity. He's a famous activist investor, swooped in. Um, he and Antioco basically came to complete loggerheads. Uh, eventually, Antioco was fired. Uh, a, a new caretaker guy was put in. Both of those initiatives were stopped, and we know what happened. Uh, Blockbuster eventually um, you know, was brought to its knees and went bankrupt. Carl Icahn did just fine, but <laughs> you know the company didn't, didn't manage to survive for the long run. But it wasn't that they didn't see it, and it wasn't that they didn't take action to try to address uh, this issue. A uh, second story that I talk about is Kodak. And, you know, the line about Kodak is always, oh, big, dumb, lumbering company that missed the digital revolution. And that's not true. That's just not true. They invented the digital camera very famously. Um, and they actually made digital cameras for about three years running in the mid O's. Kodak was producing the number one digital camera in the entire United States. They were the best selling cameras anybody had. Uh, they didn't make a lot of profit on them because by then it was easy to copy the digital technology and other players were in it. But it wasn't that they didn't see the digital. What ultimately doomed Kodak was Antonio Perez, who was their CEO, had come up through the ranks at Hewlett Packard and made his name running their printing business, lost out on the bid to become CEO to Carlo Fiorina, was determined, I think, to sort of show them, um, and drove Kodak over a cliff into printing just as screens were getting good enough that nobody needed to print to see images later on. So it's not that Kodak didn't see it, didn't get it, didn't understand. It's that their CEO made a decision, I suspect out of very personal motivations, to take them into a category that was basically doomed. One of the things that always comes up with your work is, for me, people will kind of go, oh, that's not true that Nokia had developed a touchscreen phone and a touchscreen tablet. And I go, just go and ask Rita McGrath. She held it in her hands. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. That's another story that people don't know. And I'd love you to share that because this one is so important because, again, they were magnificent innovators. Nokia was one of my heroes in terms of innovation. What basically happened was that their CEO, who really was behind a lot of their innovations, um, was replaced by a guy who was much more financially driven. Um, Ali Pekka Kalasbuo was his name. And 2007, right, he's on the cover of Forbes magazine. And uh, the headline is, you know, one billion cell phones. Can anyone catch the cell phone king? You know, and this kind of 
publicity just reinforces this idea that you know what you're doing. And so what happened was they actually invented a lot of today's, what we would recognize as today's modern technologies. And I literally held in my hands what we would think of as an iPad. It had connection to the internet. It, it didn't have a touch screen. It operated with a stylus, but everything else was, was way, way, way ahead of its time. And in the case of Nokia, it wasn't that they didn't have the innovative products, is that there was a gap between their willingness to take those to market uh, and, and what the company was capable of doing. And when they became more financially driven, the, con the concept was, well, you know, if I can print a million phones and sell them to China, why would I, why would I want to introduce this whole new line of products? Why would I want to create this new category? Which was a very different mindset than the mindset that got them into the whole mobile phone area in general. And Nokia is a fascinating example of a company that's just reinvented itself so many times. Um, and, and so the, the DNA is still there. And today, people don't realize this. They think Nokia is bankrupt. It's not. It's a thriving network company. But it's in a very different category and a very different business. And it's not consumer facing so much as it was once. I love talking to you and I talk to you all day, as you know, and we're we have a very special project coming down the line that I will reveal in good time. And I'm, I'm going to be so happy to deep dive into many of your projects there and inter including discovery driven growth and discovery driven planning, which is a huge part of what you teach. And it's so essential to be able to figure out what's going to happen when you don't know what's going to happen. And there's a reason I say that because you mentioned there, for example, Nokia and, oh, let's sell them on to a different market or a new market, the same product, a new market. And what happens in so many companies I'd love you to share is just as with Nokia, just as with Kodak, where your dad worked as well. Many people don't know that, but your dad worked there because he saw what was happening in the inside the company. They become captive to their customers and therefore can't see a use case for a new customer and this even happens in startups when they have the mental model almost crystallized it's very hard to change to a different to a different customer yeah, it is. Um, and what's also interesting is that you may have an initial customer in mind when you set out into a new business or a new line of business. Um, but what you'll often find in the marketplace is customers will discover something about what you're doing that may not be what you had in mind at all. Um, and, and I find that's interesting because a lot of entrepreneurs and innovators are very reluctant to let go of that first idea of who their customer is going to be. So an example from history is the guy that invented Novocaine did not want it used as a numbing medicine at all. <laughs> that was not what he what he foresaw for his invention. Uh, and yet that's what the market eventually ended up demanding. If you are interested in Rita's work, which you absolutely should be, if you're interested in the field of transformation, leadership growth, team dynamics, everything to do with transformation, Rita has a wealth of content on her site. And indeed, uh, e-learning projects where you can go along and learn from Rita there, as well as her work in Columbia Business School. Rita, perhaps you'll tell our audience where they can find you, where they can find out more about your work. Well, a good place to start is my website, which is RitaMcGrath.com. So that's pretty easy. And you'll find an archive of articles and blogs that I've written under ThoughtSparks. You'll also find out about having me come speak for your company. If you're interested in participating in a course, you'll have information there. There's an events tab where you'll see all the different places I'm going to be. Uh, so that's a really good place to start. The other place to go for additional resources is Valise, which is V-A-L-I-Z-E.com. And that's where you'll find out about the tools and the diagnostics and the software that we're building and those kinds of things. And Rita, I'm so looking forward to that project we're going to work on. I won't reveal it now, even though it's on the tip of my tongue, but it's always a massive pleasure to have you on the show. Author of Seeing Around Cor Corners, The End of Competitive Advantage and Discovery Driven Growth, amongst others. Rita McGrath, always a pleasure to have you on the show. Oh, it's delightful. Thank you, Aiden.